Good morning. Well, again, we're, we're coming here today with a topical message for you. I know it's not the normal diet of our church, but um, it's, a, it's a good opportunity to present some information that we don't always get to present as we're waiting on the Lord to reveal it uh, through the slow digestion of different passages of, of God's Word. So, uh, but we will return shortly to that uh, practice. So, um, this is going to be kind of a second part to what Matt did last week on the issue of propaganda and the Christian mind and how we're to live and deal with that in this world. So if I asked you right now to take every thought that you have had for the last week and to categorize it into negative or positive categories, where would the weight be? Would most of your thoughts be in the negative category um, as you consume news and, and media and social media and movies and worldly information, or would it be in the positive? If I asked you to do the, th the same thing and sort your thoughts this past week into thoughts that involve the world or thoughts that specifically involve the kingdom of God, where would your thoughts lie? Why are people so angry today? Why is society so messed up? Why does our country seem to be falling apart and many others across the world? Pew Research Center found in the last year that approximately 42% of Americans have a positive view of socialism, a political and economic theory that, as many of you know, is utterly opposed to America's founding principles. What has changed? What has happened to change public opinion so drastically that the American experiment is a failed one? George Orwell, who many of you are familiar with, lived through some of the darkest times of world history, witnessing firsthand and writing about some of the evils of Soviet communism and the destruction of human decency in the early part of the 20th century. So I'm going to begin with a few quotes from George Orwell, first from his classic novel, 1984. Don't you see that the whole aim of new speak is to narrow the range of thought? In the end, we shall make thought crime literally impossible because there will be no words in which to express it. By 2050, earlier probably, all real knowledge of old speak will have disappeared. The whole literature of the past will have been destroyed. Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton, and Byron, they'll exist only in new speak versions, not merely changed into something different, but actually changed into something contradictory of what they used to be. Even the literature of the party will change. Even the slogans will change. How could you have a slogan like freedom is slavery when the concept of freedom itself has been abolished? The whole climate of thought will be different. In fact, there will be no thought as we understand it now. Orthodoxy means not a thing, not needing to think. Orthodoxy is unconsciousness. One of these days, thought Winston with sudden deep conviction, Syme will be vaporized. He is too intelligent. He sees too clearly. He speaks too plainly. The party does not like such people. One day he will disappear. And then a quote from The Road to Wigan Pier. To sum up, there is no chance of writing the conditions that I described in the earlier chapters of this book or of saving England from fascism. Unless we can bring an effective socialist party into existence, it, it will have to be a party with genuinely revolutionary intentions, and it will have to be numerically strong enough to act. We can only get it if we offer an objective 
which fairly ordinary people will recognize as desirable. Beyond all else, therefore, we need intelligent propaganda. Less about class consciousness, expropriation of the expropriators, bourgeoisie ideology, and proletarian solidarity, not to mention sacred sisters, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, and more about justice, liberty, and the plight of the unemployed, and less about mechanical progress, tractors, the building of a dam, the latest salmon catching, uh, canning factory in Moscow, that kind of thing is not an integral part of socialist doctrine, and it drives away many people whom the socialist cause needs, including most of those who can hold a pen. All that is needed is to hammer two facts home to the public consciousness. One, that the interests of all exploited people are the same, and second, that socialism is compatible with common decency. Societies such as the Soviet Union and the dystopian fantasy one of 1984 by George Orwell are built, as it's said in those quotes, with the bricks of propaganda. And so that's what we'll be talking about today. With that, let's pray. Father, thank you for revealing to us your word for giving it to us to freely use, to study, and forgive us for forsaking that study so often. Please help us now to be blessed by your word and the concepts therein, and help us to grow in the way that we use our mind to forsake sin, to repent of the misuse of our mind, and to... Think on things above, things that are lovely and, and upright and godly, and help us with this task by all grace to your glory in Christ's name. Amen. Our purpose in presenting this message to you, uh, as is last week, is for you primarily to love God with all of your mind. This involves freeing your mind with the truth of God's Word in order to help you recognize and resist worldly propaganda, to help you train your mind towards godly thoughts, to help you resist Satan and the world systems that he's put in place to cause you to sin. During this message, we are going to answer questions about what propaganda is. We'll cover some systematic theology topics about God's Word and its authority, the, the role of your mind in, in creation, and the power of Satan in this world. And, and then we'll talk at the end about what we actually see manifested in this world and what you as a believer should do about all of this. So as Matt covered last week, propaganda has a long history. It's been around um, as, as long as Communication has been around, and it has turned from a small group of controlling interests to today where each and every one of you is a practical propagandist with uh, the power of social media, the internet at your fingertips. Each one of us has been equipped to do this thing called propaganda with um, e even And even this system we see is a system of control as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of these uh, social media companies filter what we are exposed to and spin what we're able to see. And they make sharing and liking and forwarding the norm uh, rather than us creating and studying and investigating a topic. Now we just flick it along to the next person. Again, to define propaganda for us, as Matt did last time, a good definition is that propaganda is a coordinated attempt to influence a large or small number of people to some idea or action. And as, as Matt mentioned, this is most effectively done without the knowledge of the one or many being influenced. And so I, I want to start this subject by 
um, looking at some systematic theology um, coverage of, of these topics. Systematic theology, if, if you don't know, is basically taking a topic, an idea, and approaching the Scriptures looking for that idea explained and, and described throughout all of Scripture. So often, uh, for example, if, if you want to know about parenting, you would approach the Scriptures and say, what, what verses, what passages describe parenting, and what can we learn about that topic? So uh, we'll do that today with a few helpful topics on this issue. Uh, first, as regards the Scriptures, uh, Matt covered this in detail this past week, so we don't need to belabor that much more. Uh, but just to reemphasize, one of the main issues in our world, our country, our culture today is an authority issue, an authority issue. Most cultural sin, most propaganda, worldliness stems from the fact that we have an authority problem in our society and world. It is the authority of God versus the authority of man. Uh, there, there are only two options, and as we know as believers and as we see in God's Word, Scripture is the ultimate authority for all of life, truth, and practice. Any information or worldly authority that contradicts the authority of God's Word is wrong and should be d dismissed outright as ungodly. The news of the Scriptures is bound up in what we call the Gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And that, and that news is that uh, God is King, He is Creator of this world. Men have sinned, and the world has come to a fallen and corrupted state as a result. As a result of our sin, ma mankind, all of us, are born depraved and deserving of the full wrath and justice of God being eternally punished by Him. However, the Scriptures say that there is hope in that God has become man, has taken on flesh in the form of Jesus Christ as Son, has lived a perfect life here, fulfilling, and glorif fulfilling the mission of God and glorifying Him, and has also died as a substitute, taking that wrath that anger that we deserved on his own back. And in doing so, he has provided full forgiveness and full promise that we can now be declared righteous and live eternally with him instead of dying a just death under the wrath of God. So this message of the gospel, that, that message that I briefly presented to you, is the crux, the central message of the Scriptures. And this is what has authority. Uh, so that's the first thing in the systematic theology, as, as the Scriptures have authority. Secondly, there are a couple truth categories that I want to cover regarding the mind. The Scripture talks a lot about uh, men's minds. The first truth we see from Scripture that's clear to many of us is that the mind of a non-believer is different than the mind of a believer. The mind of a non-believer in the Scriptures is said to be enslaved, is said to be bound up to worldly thinking. And in fact, it goes as far as to say that a natural mind is unable to comprehend those things of God fully. It also says that a non-believer rejects the authority of God's Word, this authority that we were just speaking of. In Romans 1, it makes it rather clear. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them for His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But, and listen to this, they became futile 
in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And so we see evidence of that truth here that the mind of a non-believer is enslaved. It is captive to ungodly thinking. God himself has given them up to futile thinking and to a debased mind. 1 Corinthians 2, uh, as, as I've said, go, it goes as far as to say the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly or foolishness to him. And he is not even able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So even worse than being resistant to God, even worse than rejecting or being at, being at enmity with God in their minds, they also do not even possess the ability to understand spiritual things. In Romans 8, verse 5 through 8, it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So we see here again, the mind of a non-believer is resistant to God. It's at enmity with God. It's futile and foolish in its thinking. Uh, a non-believer cannot discern things that are spiritually discerned. And a mind that, that does not have faith is set on things that are in this world, fleshly things. And these minds of non-believers do not submit to the law of God because they can't. They cannot please God. And we should not be surprised at reading this in the New Testament for uh, what, what do we read in, in the book of Genesis, the condition of mankind uh, left to their devices. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man, and it grieved him to his heart. 2 Corinthians 4 says, But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God, and even... If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Listen to this part. In their case, those that are perishing, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So this is the condition of the unbelieving mind at enmity with God resistant to him, unable to comprehend spiritual things, debased, foolish. 
But what about a believer's mind? We struggle with sin. We struggle with difficult times. We doubt. We fall into temptation. So how are we different? The scriptures say that the mind of a believer is a mind that is free. Free to pursue godly things or even to fall for worldly things. Matthew 16, 23, Christ talking to Peter says, Get behind me, Satan, for you are a hindrance to me. You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. It's clear that Peter could do one of those things, and, and unfortunately he has chosen to set his mind here on the things of man. Colossians 3 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So it seems there that we are being commanded to change our mind, to direct our mind there as believers towards heavenly things, towards eternal things. 2 Corinthians 10 says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. What a thought that every, everything that comes through our minds could be captivated by obedience to Christ. And then Romans 12, which most of us know, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't be conformed to this world. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Philippians 4. Finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. How many of us can describe our thought life in this way? I always think of lovely, upright, wonderful, godly things, eternal things, right? But that's what we're called to do as, as a believer. Romans 7 is a, is a good kind of internal dialogue of Paul to think about that kind of fleshly struggle that each of us have. Paul says there, Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. 
uh, bipolar disorder right there, right? But how many of you can identify with this very thing that um, we, we tell ourselves all the time, you're going to behave this way this week. You are going to accomplish this goal. You are going to do this task. And you are going to do this godly thing for the sake of the kingdom. And then a day later, we're doing the opposite and forgetting about what we promised ourselves. And so that, that just goes again to that point that we're trying to make. The mind of the unbeliever, captive, bound, at enmity with God, foolish, enslaved. The mind of the believer, free. Free to seek, to think, to move towards godly things, things above, to obey but also free to fall, free to fall to those pulls of the flesh, those pulls of the world, those pulls of Satan's power. So that's the second systematic issue there, what the mind is like, the the non-believer and the believer. The third systematic theology issue we want to cover is as regards the world and Satan's power. Since his instigation of evil on earth, Satan has been named prince, god, or ruler of this world in multiple places in the scriptures. 1 John 5 goes as far as to say, We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Ephesians 2, uh, at the beginning, says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. John 14, Christ speaking, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. So we see here, Satan is said to have power in the whole world. He's said to have established as a prince a system in the world that binds men to sin and to fleshly passions. And he's said to be a ruler in this world. Next, Satan is said to be the enemy of God and truth. We see this in Matthew 13, Matthew 30, uh, or, or sorry, Matthew uh, 2, um, 2 Thessalonians 2. And we also see that Satan does everything he can to tempt individuals. Genesis 3, Luke 22, 1 Timothy 3. And Satan also does everything that he can to, to even tempt larger groups of people. We see this in 1 Thessalonians 3, Revelation 2. Um, we also see that even more zoomed out, Satan leads the whole world astray, as it says in Revelation 12. And how does he do this? Well, the scriptures also say, as you systematically approach this, this topic, that Satan accomplishes this, these tasks by various means. He appeals to man's pride, as we see in multiple uh, passages. He interferes with the transmission of truth. And he also places false believers within the church itself. 
In John 8, Jesus says, Satan is a liar and the father of it. But thankfully, as we see in Job, ultimately Satan is on a leash at the behest of God's sovereignty. So these are the systematic issues we need to consider when talking about propaganda and the mind. Some conclusions from, from these passages are, are that non-believers are held captive in their minds by Satan. Satan is given a certain dominion as a prince of this world, and he has much authority and influence over this world, though limited by God. Satan invests much energy into corrupting people, including believers, especially the corruption of their minds. And finally, as we saw at the beginning, Scripture is the authority for all truth. So, as an outcome of these systematic issues, what do we expect to see in this world? Why do we go on the news? Why do we go on social media and become flabbergasted that sin could ever happen in our society? That a politician would ever lie? That a financer would ever cheat someone out of money? Why are we surprised? We should not be surprised to see our world and our culture filled with propaganda designed to pull us away with Christ or away from Christ. If Satan has dominion over much of the world's systems, if he is a liar that invests much energy and time into the corruption of your mind, why should we be surprised that our world is filled with propaganda and lies and manipulation? To get us away from Christ. We should expect propaganda to be everywhere and in everything that the world creates. And we should expect non-believers to be unable to escape this worldly propaganda. This, this shouldn't be a surprise either. We, we, we see this information out there and, and we can't believe that, that uh, this information exists. And then we can't believe even more that someone would believe this stuff, Right? Uh, but the scriptures are not surprised, and God is not taken aback. We should also expect the world's systems to be corrupted in part or in whole against the truth of God's word. So not only information that's out there, not only people that are out there, but, but even whole systems of organization and society and countries and leadership and government we should expect to be corrupted in part or in whole and at enmity with the authority issue that we talked about, with the authority of God's Word. So why are we surprised? Secondly, we, we, we should not be surprised to find ourselves deeply affected by propaganda. And, and this is the one where I, I want you to, to hurt and squirm a little bit. We should not be surprised to find ourselves deeply affected by propaganda. We should first of all expect that we have already been infected by much worldly propaganda. We should expect that we currently have habits that are increasing the influence of worldly propaganda on our mind. Think about what you do. Think about where you spend your time, think about where your information comes from. If you think that it's not having an effect on you, you are sorely mistaken. If you think that you can spend hours and hours on social media, on CNN, on Fox News, or wherever you get your information and not be greatly affected by it, you are kidding yourself. We should expect that we don't even realize most of the worldly propaganda that has already infected our thinking. 
So not only should you realize that, yeah, I see some parts of me that, that are twisted towards the world systems, possibly influenced by that power. You should expect as well that Satan has been creative enough to influence you in ways that you don't even realize at this moment. And this should call us to self-reflection and prayer. Why are we surprised at these things? And so here, here's some of what we see. Uh, first, firstly, uh, tribalism. If you're not familiar with that term, just, just think of you know a, a club, a tribe. All of us have been influenced in ways to push ourselves into little segments of society, into little cliques, into little tribes. This is what tribalism is. Much of what I personally see on the news and in social media is designed to create larger and larger gaps between each um, segment of society, to divide us and to segment us out into our own little cliques and worldviews. If I, if I even mention the word CNN, do you, do you cringe because you're a Fox News guy? If I mention Fox News, do you cringe because you're a PBS guy? Um, if, I, if I mention you know, some social media company um, or some theory or conspiracy or whatever, um, much of us have strong opinions already established, uh, strong, strong thoughts, and they cause a strong reaction within us if I were to mention whatever you can think of, you know, masks and vaccines and war and, you know, any, any sort of thing. And e each of you probably already has a very well-established, with a layer of concrete around it, a set of beliefs in, in those certain areas. And uh, obviously one big one would be how, how you fall politically, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. Those are the only two systems out there, right? And, um, and so... We, we need to be careful as Christians, and we need to realize that this is happening to us. Um, when, whenever we talk about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is to be our only tribe that the Scriptures prescribe for us. We are described as aliens in this world, as members of a society, a kingdom, a city that is beyond this place. And this is to be our only tribe. Now, is it wrong to have opinions? Certainly not. But the, the point that we want to make here is that propaganda, the information that you have been exposed to, is purposely, intentionally trying to ma manipulate you into these little segments of society. And I want to caution you, as, as we'll talk about a little later, on uh, being prey to this. Our only tribe, our only commitment, our only authority, our only source of truth and family and fellowship is the kingdom of God and His Word. And so, with that, any other tribe should be up on the plate for abandonment, whether it be uh, you, whether you're a lifelong Republican or Democrat or, or whether you like this particular news channel or, or whatnot, you should be willing to abandon those tribes those things, those opinions in a heartbeat if they turn out to be contrary to the Word of God and if they even negatively affect your Christian worldview. But it's what we see. Tribes everywhere. One opinion comes out and half the country goes this way, half the other, maybe even a, a fourth, maybe there's three views or four. But we need to realize this is being done to us and be careful. One problem that we see along these lines is an overconsumption of worldly media. In the past, uh, we, we see that propaganda was, was a little bit more difficult. You know, you, you would have to spread the word around through oral tradition just to get the word out. And then, and then what do we have? We had uh, maybe a printing press, mass distribution of written material to get information out faster and more efficiently. And then what? 
radio, newspaper, magazines. Boom, boom, boom. Quick, quick, quick. Get that information out there. Get those opinions out there as fast as possible. And, oh boy, now we are in trouble. We, we have unlimited access to, to unlimited information in the, in the palm of our hand at any moment of any day, as long as we keep it charged, right? And, and we, can, we can find any opinion about any topic that we could think of, and we can broadcast our opinion about any topic we can think of in an instant to thousands, maybe millions of people. And what has this made? This has made us consumption monsters. We have been trained, manipulated, and propagandized to become consumers of information. And while some of this is helpful and can, can benefit society, of course, and benefit uh, the economy and, and so on and so forth, how dangerous it is to know that we are constantly being flooded with information, 99% of that's not produced by anyone with a Christian worldview or anyone under the authority of Scripture. So this is what we see, tribalism, overconsumption of worldly media. And what is the result? Division, again, divide, divide, conquer, division within society, division within the church. As, as Joey will, will tell you, you know, there's many good things going on in, in the convention, but uh, in the Southern Baptist Convention, but there's also many concerning things. Um, diverse views, uh, leftist views seeping into the church, postmodernism, all of these things. And, and I can't help to think that if we were all Amish in practice, it probably wouldn't have happened. But maybe. But. How quickly can a group like this be turned with the flick of a finger and, and with the immediate distribution of all this worldly information? And what has happened to us because of our overconsumption of this media, because of our tribalism, because of our division? We have become little addicts of negativity, even violence. We're addicted to conflict. And unknowingly and dangerously, we are even addicted to fear. If you've ever been able to step out, to step back, to zoom out and look at all of media, 99% of everything that comes out is conflict, violence, fear, to make you feel negative about yourself, about this world, or about the other tribe. How dangerous. It is. But again, why, why are we surprised? Why are we surprised? I think of the gladiator arenas and, and uh, such events as this. How sick it is to, to think about. We, we watch these movies and we cheer, you know, for Russell Crowe when he is fighting people. But, you know, how, how sick it is to think that masses of thousands of people would gather to watch people hacked in two and, and their blood laying all around, animals eating them in front of everyone and cheering you know, at, at whoever their guy was that day. And we, we may think that, oh, we would never go to such a thing, but we, we do it with this now, don't we? We watch videos and movies and entertain ourselves with ultra-violent, ultra-worldly pictures and videos. And what has happened? This addiction to negativity and fear and conflict has resulted in a numbness to immorality. We're numb to it. But should we be, should we be surprised? So these are the outcomes of propaganda, of worldliness on earth. And we should not be as surprised to see it. But hopefully many of you are surprised that you haven't thought more about it in your own life, in the life of this society, in your family, in your friends. Think about your worldview. 
What does worldview mean? A, a worldview is a set of beliefs and values that each one of us has. Each one of us has a separate and unique worldview. How we view the world, our own little set of, of ideas and ideals. This worldview that we have is residing in our mind and it functions as a filter by which we pass all information that comes to us. All of your worldviews um, function as a filter and so anytime you are delivered news from, from Fox News or CNN or from Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or wherever, that information goes through that filter and what comes out on the other side depends on the contents of that filter. And guess who builds your filter? Well, as Christians, certainly God sovereignly builds that worldview and that filter by giving you His Spirit. But we have a lot of pull and control in that process as well. As we sin, as we expose ourselves to worldly information, as we clog up, our filters with ungodly things, the filter begins to change. And what happens as a result? Information far, uh, farther out in the future, it changes when it goes through that filter that we have allowed sin and our flesh to create. Our worldview becomes skewed, and as a result, our information gets skewed. And as an even worse result of that, disobedience, sin, worldliness are the result for Christians. And so mind your mind. Mind your mind. So these are the outcomes of the systematic theology issues that we should not be surprised to see. But hopefully we are, if not before, now more aware of. So what do we do with that information? How, how do we act? What is the Christian application of this information? Well, hopefully it's already become clear what to do. Again, how many of you say, can say right now that more than 50% of your thought life this week has been positive? based on positive things and not negative. How many of you can say that more than 50% of your thought life have been about kingly things, about godly things, about things of God's kingdom, rather than things of this world? All those passages we read, what do they say? They say, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Think on good and positive and upright and godly things. Think on eternal things, things above. What are all these commands, not recommendations, commands, talking about? These scriptures indicate that our minds can be shaped and formed by the Spirit of God by obeying Him in this way. These scriptures indicate that our minds are fluid, that they are able to be trained, that they're able to be shaped into minds much like the mind of Christ, who we are to emulate. And so very simple with those verses. Change your thinking. Wake up every day and tell yourself and meditate on these scriptures that I will think on good and lovely and upright things. I will think on godly things. I will think on things above. And where do we get most of that information? From His Word. From fellow believers encouraging us, edifying us in the faith. Not from Fox News. <clears throat> what else can we do? Well... Very obviously as well, stop consuming so much worldly information. Reduce, if not eliminate, if you need to, your use of social media. Even the holy grail of watching news. Can you imagine yourself without watching news for a week? I imagine most of you do. Do. 
It's worth it. Reduce your consumption of worldly information. That filter in your mind, that filter as part of your worldview, gets changed by the volume of what you put into it. As Matt said last week, garbage in, garbage out. The more worldly information that comes in, the more that filter changes, the more your worldview changes, and the more your actions, your thoughts, your peace, your joy changes. But the more Scripture, the more godly things that we put into our mind, the more encouragement from brothers and sisters in Christ, the more positive and eternal and heavenly thinking changes that filter the other way to where information coming in, though it may be negative or positive, gets filtered in a way that is consistent with the Scriptures and consistent with the kingdom of God. I want all of us to meditate on what tribes we've placed ourselves into. What tribe are you in? When I mention a particular controversial topic, do you immediately spin and hold down the fort at whatever concrete building you've made in that part of your worldview? Have you researched that topic as much as you've researched God's Word? Do you spend as much time in God's Word as you do spending time with the effects of mRNA vaccines on a human body? Or whether a mask is effective? Or whether um, abortion should be illegal and outlawed in every state? You know, have you spent as much time in God's Word as you have studying these things? What tribe do you fall in? We all need to reorient ourselves to realize our tribe, our only authoritative permanent tribe is the kingdom of God. And our family is the church. And Christ is the head of this tribe. All other tribes are to be abandoned at any point where they contradict the word of God or even negatively influence our Christian worldview. Loose your hands on these things. Loose your hands on these tight ropes that you've tied around yourself by consuming this conflicting, divisive information that this world offers us, this propaganda. Realize that it has affected you deeply, severely, and probably for a long time. Reconsider your positions in light of the Christian worldview and hold those, hold those ropes with loose hands to those other tribes that you have found yourself to be a part of while God is holding tightly the rope that binds you to His kingdom. Fight, as Paul did within, against your temptation in this area. War with yourself. Meditate on God's Word so God's Word can force out the garbage that you have allowed to seep in. Propaganda is a strong and powerful force in our culture today. And we as Christians are responsible for taming it in our own lives. We need to pray that God gives us grace to realize how deeply we've been influenced by the world and how terrible our habits are for allowing us to be further influenced by the world. Propaganda is a powerful force, and yet it is no match for God's Word and God's truth in a Christian worldview. Think on things above, on things that are lovely and upright and eternal. Change your mind. Resist and realize that Satan has set up systems all around you to try to seep into your home and to lead you astray from God. Repent and turn from these behaviors and God will bless you and give you the ability to do so. For some of you, it will be extremely difficult, as it is for me, to do this sort of thing. 
Some of you, it'll be easier. But all of us have been subject to, to this worldly influence. And so, as we pray now, I, I'd like all of you to reflect on those areas, as you probably have been already, by which you've been affected and influenced by worldly propaganda. Repent of your habits that allow this to happen and confess to God that you will seek Him and meditate on good, godly things, things of His Word. And with that, let's pray. Father, we are humbled before you today. Many of us, most of us, all of us, have some sort of captivity to the world system. Many of us have allowed ourselves to lazily be influenced by all of these evil, dark, worldly companies. All of us have allowed ourselves to be influenced by negative thinking, by worldliness, and most of us are consuming far too much worldly information and far too little of the information that you have provided in your word. Free our minds, Father, from this temptation and help us to lean on you as the only source of good, authoritative, righteous thinking. Bless our minds, Father, with grace and cut our bonds to this system of the world so that our only bonds may be voluntary ones that we've made with you and your eternal kingdom. We love you and ask that you bless every saint in this place. In Christ's name, amen.